a lot of the kids you're working with are probably very highly intelligent, mm -hmm. which means that they're going to make a lot of predictions. That's what intelligence is about. It's taking a couple pieces of data and then extrapolating from that data. And if that data is even just the slightest bit inaccurate, then the further out you go, the more off course those predictions become. The landscape where neurodiversity lives is shifting. Where are changes happening? Where do they need to happen? How is the shift in language impacting the way society looks at neurodivergent people? Also, these new conversations are helping adults recognize their own neurodivergence later in life. How can they deal with that new knowledge? Brandon Tessers is a licensed professional counselor and founder of Effective Artistry and does professional development for counselors and teachers. He joins us for episode 130. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. I'm not sure if you've checked the calendar, but here in the U.S., our summer break from school is at about the halfway point. For the past several weeks, I've been flying around the country helping educators and school districts train and prepare for a new school year of teaching neurodivergent students. And if you're a gifted or special education coordinator or otherwise active in the gifted program at your school, we're offering an online course for continuing education and professional development. It's called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. The course is already in place in many districts and in one case statewide, and we've been in contact with people from all around the world. We have a version for individuals who want to take the course independently, a classroom-style version for a district facilitator to conduct training for groups, or districts can buy license bundles so their educators can take the course on their own time. We have a link to the course in the show notes, or you can go to neurodiversity.university for more information. Our talk with Brandon Tessers is next. On a previous episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast. I think there is this kind of in our cultural DNA still, this idea that properly behaving, you know, children should be seen and not heard. I think there's kind of this mystical, unspoken idea that behavior management is appropriate and, and somehow valued. Somehow, with how the research was interpreted as successful, it became the mainstay of our education system. And when you look at the science, the neuroscience of resilience, and you lay that side by side to behavioral management, the two don't line up very well. That's episode 116. Find it in your favorite podcast app. You are listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today, we are talking with Brandon Tessers. Brandon is a licensed clinical professional counselor outside of Chicago, Illinois, at his practice, Effective Artistry. He specializes in neurodiversity and executive functioning. So, Brandon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. I guess it's a return visit, actually. It is. Yeah, actually, yeah. You've been a guest on the podcast before, which was one of our very first episodes. Um, episode two, <laughs> literally our second episode. Um, and we talked about gaming and, and why bright kids might be drawn to it. But I do not really encourage anyone to go back and listen to that because, <laughs> I mean, not, not for you, but just for me, because we've made a lot of changes since then. We've polished things up a little bit. It's like you don't want people to see your high school yearbook yes. photo, you know, like that doesn't represent me anymore right right um but it, yeah but tell us what have you been doing professionally since you were last here uh well a couple of years ago launched this practice effective artistry um like you said we specialize here in neurodiversity and executive functioning and creativity as well although i have been downplaying that one more because artistry is already in the title and everybody just thinks we're working specifically with artists mm. even though creativity obviously is all across literally every domain um, but we have some therapists here. We also do some executive functioning coaching, just trying to specialize in, well, as you know, you know, we do that neurodiversity affirming 
peer consultation group together. Yes, it has a very long name. <laughs> yeah, I know. We needed something a lot snappier than that. We haven't really settled on anything yet, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So just focusing in on exploring and, and developing specific ways of working that are best for neurodivergent people, and which of course, like all the universal design and inclusive stuff is really better for everybody. But of course, pretty egotistical thing to say this way that we're trying to work is better for everybody. <laughs> well, no, but I think that's one of the big movements within, well, disability rights and neurodiversity in general is understanding that making things accommodating is good for all people. It's not just good for the people who maybe it was originally developed for. You know, we create things to solve a problem, but then sometimes that solution has a broader appeal. You know, I, I talk a lot about like intergenerational transmission from family systems work, that humans are really, really good at solving problems, generally speaking, and really, really terrible at revisiting old solutions to find out whether they're still necessary or whether there's better options or whether something that used to be helpful is now harmful. So things just kind of continue and build over time. And I think there's a lot of that in, in therapy, I think in education, I mean, really every big industry, but all these things make sense when they're developed and then new and different things happen and we build and we grow and we want to be ready to adapt and change. That's kind of, to me, the, the core of the approach of working with in a neurodiversity affirming way is that everybody's different. Mm -hmm. It's not just we want to have different methods for different neurotypes or anything. Those are still big categorizations. It's how do we work in a way that is specifically about tuning into the person in front of us and developing something for them specifically. I'm curious, you were talking about revisiting past solutions and seeing if they are still helpful or necessary or perhaps even harmful. Is there an example that you could give of that? Yeah, sure. I. It's funny because the, the example that I have been using when I've been giving presentations for this concept for like years and years is handshaking. And it's a very different uh, context now after the pandemic, or not after the pandemic, after the pandemic began, right? Mm -hmm. If you talk to like anthropologists and Different people have different theories about the origin of handshaking, but generally speaking, it's mostly thought to be a way of demonstrating mutual vulnerability, that you're meeting a stranger on the road and it's dangerous. If I let you hold my hand, that's a pretty good sign to you that I don't intend you harm because I wouldn't make myself that vulnerable and vice versa. Of course, if you ask somebody right now to develop, hey, we need a kind of universally recognized greeting that you give to strangers that you've never met and maybe hundreds of people in a day, in a busy day. Since the development of germ theory, we would never in a million years say, <laughs> let's touch each other on the hands for a minute. So it made sense in that context, because what we do, a lot of this work and these theories and stuff is based around executive functioning as the management of finite resources. We only can notice so much. And generally, we notice things that are problematic. So if we put a solution into place and it solves the problem and doesn't cause a problem in and of itself, then it just sticks around because the way that we learn is by observing others. So our parents are doing it and we pick it up and then our kids pick it up from us until it causes a problem, which why I love that this is the one that I've been using for five years. Because now, honestly, there have been some episodes, my wife and I rewatch a lot of the same shows over and over. <laughs> and there are episodes of shows where it's like, it's from before 2020 and somebody's a germaphobe and the, the joke is, what a weirdo. And then in a new context, it's like, why are they all making fun of that person? <laughs> <laughs> We're all a little bit there now. I mean, I don't shake hands with people a ton, but it feels weird now. The brain, so I'm a big fan of the cognitive miser theory, which is the idea that the brain only spends resources if it has a reason to do so, including even resources like attentional resources. So even noticing a thing in the first place. What that means is that we hate having to spend those resources on something. We hate when there's something that we've never had to think about before, and now all of a sudden we have to think about it. Mm. it's uncomfortable, unpleasant, sometimes even painful. And of course, you see a lot of reactions from people who will do many, many different things to be able to persist in not paying attention to something, effectively saying, no, 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 we're fine. This isn't a problem like everybody's saying that it is. Because if I acknowledge that it's a problem, I have no choice but to pay attention, which means that I can't pay attention to whatever other thing I was looking at instead that I would rather do. You and I are both aware of how much the landscape surrounding specifically neurodiversity has shifted a lot in the last few years. I think I was reflecting on that when I was thinking about what we were going to talk about today, and I was realizing how long it's been since you were lost on the podcast. And I know my outlook on things has changed quite a bit. What are some of the major changes that you've noticed? And if they have, how have they influenced you? 
I agree. There's been a lot of changes recently. That's part of the reason that I wanted to use that word to talk about the specialty that we're engaged in. Because we could, of course, use different words to talk about, you know, twice exceptional is an example that I know you do a lot with is not that different than neurodiversity mm -hmm. as a label, but it's because we kind of saw it coming. Like, wasn't neurodiversity one of the words of the year? I think last year. Yeah. And I, I think the pandemic did accelerate a lot of that because a lot of social interaction shifted to asynchronous formats and online formats where communication is a little bit different and people were starting to see things and resonate. So it's hugely more widely known. I mean, I've been on panels. People have just found me randomly and said, oh, you talk about neurodiversity. Will you come join this panel? Because it's a hot topic. And I think there's upside and downside to that. The greater awareness is great. But also, like we were just talking about, people want things to be simple. So when they become aware of something like neurodiversity, they either want to reject it or simplify it so that they can figure it out and kind of add it to their toolbox, add it to their vocabulary. So what's interesting to me is how much like active debate there is going on about all the different elements of honestly everything involved in neurodiversity. Some people will stake hardline positions. So as far as how that's impacted me, honestly, it's freed me up a lot because the truth is that we're all figuring this out. And that's always been the case. That's not how we generally go about it. You know, in our culture, it's, it's more, here's what's known to be true, learn it. Mm -hmm. And then you can maybe develop from there. I think a lot of what's great about neurodiversity is that when you're engaging with that paradigm, it requires that you acknowledge that you don't know. Mm. You really don't know anything about anything. We have theories and those theories can be useful and we can come up with predictions that turn out to be accurate even at a high rate, but we still never know. Mm -hmm. And as a neurodivergent person, I love that. And I know not everybody does, <laughs> <laughs> but I love being able to take some words and define them, you know? Yeah. You talk about just the questioning and the awareness. And I feel like there are people who, even when you talk about like the big five personality model mm -hmm. and openness to experience and specifically like just the ability to consider new and different ways of conceptualizing something. There are some people who are very open to that and who are constantly reevaluating and kind of shifting and changing and adapting their beliefs or their perspectives. And then there are other people who are much more less likely to do that. Mm. I think that through the neurodiversity movement for me, it's caused me to question a lot of things that I thought I already knew. I'm obsessed with language generally, like always have been, right? I know actually you and I are constantly going back and forth on Twitter about our wordle things, right? <laughs> language is incredible. And, and I use that a lot in my work because when we're talking about, I know I've mentioned a couple of times already, attentional resources, the, the things that guide how that attention is spent, that dictate what things are admitted into conscious awareness and what things are not. One of the things that we can manipulate most easily there to make changes is language. So you know that experience I believe it's actually technically called Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, but I could be wrong about that, where you learn a new phrase or a new word, and then all of a sudden you notice that thing seven times in the next three days, and you're like, what? I've never seen this in my life. Now it's ever... Obviously, for the most part, it was always there. It's just that without the language to be able to identify it, it's not seen as significant, right? That one way of talking about those attentional processes is that our brain is separating the signal from the noise or at least attempting to, mm -hmm. but we're wrong all the time. So new language identifies new things as signals. Our experience moment to moment and day to day is shifted because of these new concepts and new words and new conversations that we're having. I think along with those new conversations that we're having, there are a lot of adults who are realizing that they're neurodivergent later in life. And when I talk to people, I notice that there are just a lot of mixed feelings surrounding that, which might be anything from relief to finally understanding themselves, um, to grief because they recognize that they've lost so much time without having that awareness, or even resistance because um, it's difficult to accept what that might mean for them. Mm. When you're working with adult clients, is there anything that you notice about that process in helping them adapt to that new information? Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's for sure trends, right? Like we can put like a, the most common experiences into some 
buckets, some categories. Although generally, if I'm working with somebody, they like neurodiversity, right? They've come for that reason. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, it's people who are finding utility in that new label. Mm. But what I tell people, whether it's clients or in presentations or just, I mean, you know, I info dump on people all over the place about <laughs> neurodiversity. It's like all I think about is that labels, including diagnoses, especially mental health diagnoses, right? These are disorders, not diseases. They're collections of symptoms that we have found it useful to group together. And it is useful and it's valid and it's real. And they're still constructs. We made them up. We made them up because they're useful and they're arbitrarily applied. Two different diagnosticians will give two different responses about what a person is or is not. So what I try to talk about generally is there are many, many, many accurate ways to define any given thing. And the, accurate, the accuracy of any one of those ways doesn't detract from the accuracy of any other. I can hold this up, and of course your podcast listeners aren't seeing it, but it's a pen and I can say it's a pen, <laughs> or I can say it's a writing instrument, or I could say it's a metal object about yay long and cylindrical. All of those are accurate. So we're not really so concerned about what's accurate. We're concerned about what's useful. If I need to write something and I ask you, hey, you have something I can write with, it's important that you and I both have a label for this as a pen or a writing implement. If there's an electrical short and I need to like, I need something about three inches long and made of metal, and I ask you for that, it's important that we both identify this as that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll never consider it as a possible solution. So you get a new label, ADHD, autistic, dyslexic, dys whatever label, neurodivergent. I mean, there's a reason I like that big umbrella term. Mm -hmm. You're still you. You're still every other label that ever applied to you still applies. But if there's utility in this new label for you, if it for some reason enables you to do something new or something different, whether that's something like getting accommodations in a school system or at the workplace, or whether it's just a different way to engage with yourself and observe your experiences or find like-minded people to build community with, if it's useful to you, it's a good label. If it's not useful to you, it's a bad label. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you gave it to yourself and I don't care if a doctor gave it to you. If it's helpful, it's good. If it's not, it's bad. One of the differences between the clients that we work with is a lot of the clients that I'm working with are younger and so maybe haven't had a specific label when we first start working together and then there's some realizations or some different things that happen, a diagnostic process, whatever it might be. And it's always interesting the different reactions that parents have, that the clients have as they kind of try to wrap their head around it. And I realize that sometimes my perspective is not always their perspective. Like, yeah. In my mind, I'm like, this is awesome because this helps us understand you and it helps explain some of these things that we've been struggling with. And now we can kind of gives us a little bit of a roadmap, perhaps. And I have some clients who are old enough, you know, like young adults who end up being really resistant. I have clients who just have that internalized ableism and that this is bad and I don't want this. I wish I could just get rid of it. Or sometimes there's this resistance to suggestions that might be tailored to that because they don't always understand or, or really identify with that label. It's kind of an interesting process. It's interesting to watch parents also kind of process through that. Although I think most of the parents that I work with find it helpful, I think. And I mean, it is different if you're the person with getting a label applied to you or find, you know, looking at labels to apply to yourself or whatever, versus being a parent of a child that's getting labeled in a certain way. Mm. And also there's probably a little bit of, you know, survivorship bias in, in the sample there that the parents that you're working with are parents who have actively sought out support. Right. So they're pretty aware that there are some difficulties of some kind and they're looking for some guidance. Right. And that is a large part of the utility in, in these labels is, guidance, predictions. Of course, again, that can be terrible, like for the kid, right? Mm -hmm. That you're talking about the, the hypothetical child who's getting labeled as neurodivergent. Well, now they're making predictions about themselves and, and what their lives are going to be like mm -hmm. and what things are in their control or out of their control, you know, what can or cannot be changed. And they might not like it or they might like it and parents might like it or not like it. Yeah. So again, that, that's why I go back to, if you don't like it, get rid of it. What would be the point of me trying to say to someone, no, 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 I don't care whether you think it fits you or not. You are blank. And same vice versa. I'm a big proponent of self-identification in the same way that we see like discussions in, in gender identity, for example, 
that if a person selects a label for themselves and finds utility, comfort, whatever in that label, then why would we want to take it? And of course, I understand why there are some people who are anti-self-identification, but I, I disagree with that, that standpoint. I think what I end up reminding myself of when I'm working with some of those, with those young people is that my perspective on it, because I'm so in this world, is very different than theirs. Mm. And I have such a wider perspective and, and broader understanding and have seen the success, whereas they might be kind of getting you know thrown into this and, and don't really quite know where to go with it. A lot of times the reason they've ended up actually at the office is usually because of more mental health stuff that tends to be kind of what brings them in the door sometimes. And you mentioned something about mental health, but what are your thoughts about the intersection of mental health and neurodiversity or neurodivergence? There's a lot of like correlations that we can find, right, between someone who might qualify for an autism diagnosis and an anxiety disorder diagnosis. For me, one of the things that's most interesting about that generally, this is one of the debates that's being had, right? The neurodiversity is... Originally, when it was put forward, when Judith Singer like coined the term, it was a direct response to the medical model, the deficit model, the idea that any divergence from the norm is in some way detrimental. And so even, even the label, even the phrase mental health implies that there's a value in being normal and a difficulty in being different than normal. And it's not that that's not true. It's just how we frame this stuff. Honestly, a I would bet that a lot of the kids that you're talking about that are struggling when they get those labels, first of all, I think that tends to happen a lot more when people are getting diagnosed with ASD, you know, being told that they're autistic than other versions of neurodivergence. Agreed. But it's like you said, your awareness of it is so robust. You have so much information, so much granularity and specificity, and you know the differences. Whereas culturally, it's a simple story. You know, what is autism? It's this. And so they have that version of it. And then when the label gets applied to them, then they're looking and saying, oh, so basically I am that mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can do about it. Even if they're not actually, if that's not their experience, they'll have a thought that, oh, in some way, either that really is my experience and I just don't recognize it, or I'm going to change and my life will change until it is that experience. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff is done in like communication with each other individually they get to see, I think one of the values here in the Neurodiversity Podcast is exposing people to that. In, in me identifying out loud as neurodivergent, that's helpful for people to be able to see, oh, okay, well, mm -hmm. you can be well-spoken and charming. You know, I'll just compliment myself <laughs> a bunch. <laughs> no, it, it is just a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's very small. And, and honestly, again, partly because of your specialty, although I think there is a lot of overlap here, a lot of the kids you're working with are probably very highly intelligent, mm -hmm. which means that they're going to make a lot of predictions. That's what intelligence is about. It's taking a couple pieces of data and then extrapolating from that data. Any new piece of data that you get, if you're somebody who's used to running infinite permutations of the data that you have, one new piece of data leads to 8 billion million, I don't know, <laughs> a ridiculous amount of predictions, right? And if that data is even just the slightest bit inaccurate, then the further out you go, the more off course those predictions become. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, if they hear it and they hear it through that deficit model, which is still mostly how this stuff is discussed, right? That, oh, what a tragedy that your child was diagnosed autistic, mm -hmm. you know, that you must grieve and mourn for those kinds of things. If that's the messaging they've got, well, that's a little bit of inaccurate data about what it means. And then as they plug it in and start to run in, you know, scenarios in their head and make predictions about their life, it can get pretty rough pretty quickly. You mentioned that a lot of the clients that I work with are, are highly intelligent. And you know that partially because we met through the National Association for Gifted Children organization. Mm -hmm. And depending on the circles that you are a part of, uh, you can find some really different reactions to the concept of cognitive giftedness. And I'm wondering what your thoughts might be about where giftedness fits into the neurodiversity paradigm. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but they're very controversial <laughs> and I don't want to, you know, upset your audience, but that's okay. Well, first of all, I'll say that anybody who's identified as being gifted, that that label 
should be an umbrella under the umbrella term of whatever people are considering to be neurodivergent. But I also have some specific thoughts about the label of being neurodivergent. You know, the idea that there mm-hmm. is, to me, referring to a neurotypical person is the same as referring to an average person. It's a useful model, mm-hmm. but it's not a real thing. Nobody is actually exactly normal in all ways. So it's a matter of intensity of differences and degree and what differences impact you in what ways, right? Right. Well, here, I'll just go into my like actual thoughts on all this and you tell me, maybe we'll edit it all out. Uh, I honestly think that the concept of intelligence as it's discussed in our culture is getting in the way of everything Mm. because I don't think it's real. I don't think it can be, you know, the idea that there is some personal characteristic contained entirely within an individual that varies from one person to the next, but is static within a person follows them from context to context and what makes them more successful at anything that they try that is a global benefit to me and and what you know and what all the people who work with gifted children know or gifted people or who are gifted know is that it is not all sunshine and roses that that there are downsides to it so a the name is terrible yes <laughs> gifted uh both in its origins which i'm sure people have discussed on this podcast before but also just in the implication we're saying it's a gift in and of itself we're saying it is better to be this than not to be this mm-hmm. but secondly the point of neurodiversity to me is not to divide people into neurotypical and neurodivergent it's to say that everybody's different there's a wide range of how people's brains operate and that that's okay because it's situationally advantageous and disadvantageous that any way of being any non-pathological way of being anyway right like illness and injury we can generally say we don't want that but any non-pathological way of being it is situationally advantageous and disadvantageous mm-hmm. i'm i'm six five and people will see that and they're like oh that's great you're so tall it is great when i'm trying to reach something off a high shelf or when i'm walking into a room and want to make a presence, you know? And it's terrible when I'm flying across the country and coach or when I'm trying to buy clothes at the store. So intelligence, which obviously is a real thing, we observe differences between people. I'm just saying that the concept of it as a globally beneficial thing, that in all cases and in all ways, it would be better to be intelligent than unintelligent or more more intelligent than less intelligent. Mm -hmm. No, it helps you depending on what you're trying to do and in what context you're trying to do it. And it And it impedes you depending on what you're trying to do in the context in which you're trying to do it. So I definitely think it belongs that I think those individuals belong, whether the concept of giftedness has a place, I'm not so sure, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, I guess, collectively figure that out as we go forward. Well, we were kind of talking about the labels earlier and the usefulness or, or lack of usefulness or the characteristics that meet criteria for any label of anything. I mean, you know, just based on literally whatever your definition of something is like you were talking about. And I feel like within neurodiversity, there's so much overlap and confusion about like people keep trying to put things in these buckets, like they're separate, right. <laughs> separate concepts. And I sometimes will, you know, when I'm when I'm talking to clients, maybe, and we're kind of trying to figure out, we're like, okay, well, neurodivergent, that's an easy one. We can kind of see that somebody maybe falls under that umbrella. And then it's like, well, is it just giftedness? Is it ADHD? Is it autism? I'm like, well, you know, that Venn diagram there, there's a lot of gray area between those things. And it's really hard to tease out. And sometimes I wonder... I don't always know what the utility is of that necessarily. I agree. And not that there's none. I mean, again, we have these things for a reason because we can do large scale research, for example, to identify treatments and interventions for different things. And we want to be able for that process to be able to split people into buckets of what helps people who are diagnosed with ADHD versus. Mm -hmm. But there's something called the, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is called that because the concept is a guy stands and shoots a bunch of bullets at the side of his barn and then walks up afterwards and draws a circle around the densest cluster of them and says that was the target. Mm -hmm. So there's utility in drawing circles around things and saying, okay, this cluster of symptoms we're going to call ADHD and this cluster we're going to call this. The problem is when that fallacy comes in is we then think that the circle was always there Mm -hmm. instead of something that we invented in order for it to be helpful to us because it is, or at least it can be. We think that we discovered something natural that's always been there, but it's kind of a running joke online that I see of, well, autism wasn't even identified until the 1940s. Where were all the autistic people before that, (laughs) right? We didn't 
We just hadn't drawn the circle yet. <laughs> right. We hadn't found the utility in doing it that way. Mm -hmm. Same thing can be said about giftedness if you explore into like some of the, I would say, darker past of <laughs> giftedness and intelligence. Right. That it became useful to people at certain points to start caring about that where they didn't care about it before. Yeah. And again, it's like we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation. It's a, something that made sense for those people in that context, which, by the way, was a very limited group of people, obviously, the further back in the past you go, that tends to be more and more true. Mm -hmm. But then we carry it forward. We, we mythologize it as though it is some like sacrosanct knowledge as opposed to, no, it's just different people's ideas of how we all go, like executive functioning, which is the other like specialty that I talk about a lot because I think those two things impact each other, mm -hmm. that every expert on executive functioning will break it down in different ways. You know, some have as few as three sub functions and some as many as 30 some, because each of them is just looking at it and saying, what is the most useful way to break this down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's a difference between these categories for a given individual, right? That, mm -hmm. that we could take a hypothetical person and send them to this diagnostician and this other diagnostician, and one could label them OCD and the other one could label them anxiety disorder and a third one could label them ADHD. So there's utility in that, but it's all based through our biases. That's, I think, what's so important about the uh, neurodiversity affirming approach is to not supersede the client's ideas of themselves with your ideas of them. Yeah. It can be helpful to share that as new options to explore, but they get the final say. Any of these assessment processes are based on self-report or parent report or educator report, but it's just complicated. Yeah. And I think we put a lot of stock into, oh, this person has this particular label, therefore, and it's like, it's not, not useful, right? <laughs> but it's also not the be-all and end-all. To me, that's such a comforting and easy thing to accept that useful things also have limits, mm -hmm. but it seems very difficult for a lot of people. And of course, I'm, I'm talking as though I don't get it. Of course, I do that in other realms, right? In order to be able to pay this much attention and have this much knowledge about the specificity of all of this, there's a lot of other stuff I know nothing about. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people are spending their resources being aware of that stuff. Again, this is why neurodiversity is such an important concept to me. Humans are not meant to function in isolation. We, we die. Mm -hmm. You cannot take a person, isolate them from every other person and any help. They'll die. That's just how it works. Even the greatest survivalists, you drop them off in the wilderness somewhere. No tools, no nothing that ever anybody else contributed to the development of those things. And even if not, even if they know how to make... Where did they get that knowledge? Did they figure it all out on their own? We're supposed to work in community with one another. We're supposed to be different and specialized. And I focus on this while you focus on that, which works really well when we communicate with each other and when we trust each other. But when that starts to break down, and to me, honestly, I'm, I'm really indulging my like revolutionary side on this podcast today. <laughs> uh, this, this idea of hyper-individualism, a very Western and American idea. I think that's at the root of a lot of this problem. That's the intelligence thing. How do we explain why one person tends to be more successful more of the time than another person? Oh, it's, it's this thing inside them called intelligence. Can't possibly be about the networks and the ways that they've been exposed to things. And there are things I know and lots of things I don't know. And I don't need to try and invalidate somebody else's knowledge. I don't need to try and take something away from somebody else that is useful to them. If, if somebody disagrees with everything I say because whatever way they have of looking at this stuff and approaching it is helpful to them, good. I want you to reject everything that I'm saying. I'm just trying to offer different ways for those people for whom the ones that they've already been exposed to haven't been helpful. Here are some new options. These ones might be helpful. Remember, the accuracy of one way of talking about a thing does not detract from the accuracy of a different way of talking about the same thing. But I do think that's a lot of where the problems come in diagnosis in particular is because take your typical neurodivergent child who is trying very hard and cares very deeply to do what everybody around them wants them to do because that's what human beings do by default. But they're struggling. There's something they're missing. There's something that they keep messing up in some way. They follow the instructions, but it doesn't end up in the outcome everybody's expecting that it should, and we can't quite figure out how or why. 
So that kid has an experience. I had this experience. Many of us had this experience of saying, it's my fault. I'm failing because I'm doing something wrong, because I'm lazy, because I don't care enough, because whatever. And I can't understand it because A, it's not true. If I really didn't care about doing this thing, why would it bother me that I'm failing at it, right? Of course I care, or I wouldn't be so engaged with it. I wouldn't feel so terrible, but I don't know what's going wrong. And everybody's acting like it's a lack of knowledge on my part or a lack of desire or whatever. Then you get a label, a diagnosis. Oh, ADHD, oh, OCD, whatever. And there can be a, a massive amount of relief in that to say, oh, okay, it's not something I can control. It's just my biology, it's my brain, it's how I was born. There's nothing I can do about it. Still the problem exists, and that problem is still because of me and how I am, but not something I chose. So now I can stop forcing myself to try and stop beating myself up, and that, that can be so helpful. But then when somebody else comes along and says, actually, you know, even though you're diagnosed in that way, you can still try and do some things differently. <laughs> that's reopening all that stuff for me. And the value I found in it is that I don't have to think about that anymore. So don't try to get me to think about it anymore. Whether you're trying to tell me that my diagnosis isn't purely organic or whether it's somebody else who's claiming to have the same diagnosis that I have, but they're capable of doing things that I'm not capable of doing. So I'm going to say, no, nah, no, nah, you don't have it. As opposed to, no, oh, even different ones of us who both qualify for the same labels are different and we can do different things. It, it becomes this binary war almost about I've staked my identity and my relief, my value in this is based on this specific definition and anybody who tries to mess with that definition is trying to harm me by diminishing the value I've gotten out of this, making me go back to feeling like I'm lazy again. Mm -hmm. No idea what question prompted that rant. I just went on like seven different tangents, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, Brandon, I appreciate all of those tangents and am grateful <laughs> for your time today. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is fun. I know that many of you have come to this podcast because you were seeking resources for your child, or perhaps you were trying to understand and support your neurodivergent students. I also know that a large proportion of you have been on a journey of self-discovery along the way recognizing parts of yourself that were previously misunderstood. As we travel this path of creating a neurodiversity-affirming world, I hope that the validation of neurodiverse minds influences you in ways you didn't expect, whether it's in how you accept your children, your students, or yourself. I'm Emily Kircher morris I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Our thanks to Brandon Tessers. We appreciate the frank discussion. If you want to know more about him or his practice, effective artistry, go to our episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to Martin Clem, Melanie Bell, Spectacles Wallet and Watch, and Anders Nilsson for making the music for this episode. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our social media and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio technician is me, Dave Morris. For everyone here, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This is a production of the Neurodiversity Alliance. <laughs>